the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, St. Mary's. This is a great day. There's good energy in the room. All done good. The choir sounds great. I'm eight weeks and one day old as bishop. This is a good day. It's a good day. I, I begin this morning with this, this, uh, this story. This, uh, it seems as though at one point in a little church, not an Episcopal church, but in a church, a little boy came one day for his baptism. And he was really looking forward to it because he had learned, he had been told that on this day, this was the day that he was to be saved by the Lord. And he was seated on, on a pew near the front of the church. That's what we do. We put all the candidates near, near the front. He was seated, next to the, seated in the front pew next to an older, sort of grim-looking, rather quiet man. And at one point during the liturgy, this young boy, being an outgoing and uh, talkative type, he turned to this man and he said, Sir, are you here to get saved too? The man looked down sternly at the young boy and he said, Son, I will have you know that I've been a deacon in this church for over 30 years and chairman of the deacons for 15 of them. I have an honorary doctorate from the seminary and I have chaired the calling committee for the past five senior pastors. The little boy stared at him for a moment and then responded, Sir, it's okay, it really is. Doesn't matter what you've done, Jesus loves you anyway. <laughs> Now, uh, that little boy got it, right? It's not the stuff. It's not the stuff that matters. It's the love that God has for us. It really is. It really is. And so today as we baptize young Cole and, and we confirm some Christians and receive some existing ones, to all the rest of us, don't worry. Jesus loves us too. He really does. Today, in our lectionary, we are presented with two of my favorite passages of Scripture. Micah chapter 6, which is this wonderfully rich passage with, with a whole bunch to dig into. And th this whole section we just read is actually this, this magnificent rhetorical dialogue between God and the people of Israel. It's this, this back and forth debate about what it is that is important to God. And Micah paints this picture... Micah, the prophet Micah, paints a picture of the people of Israel trying to pin God down on what it is that he wanted from them. What stuff did they need to acquire, and then what did they need to do with that stuff in relationship to God? It's a series of questions and bargaining chips, but God will have none of it. The passage concludes with that wonderful verse, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness? and to walk humbly with your God. In those words, in those words, God gives us a way of life that puts everything into perspective. It really does. Here, God shows us that he does not want anything from us, but, but for us to truly love each other and to truly love him, just as we are deeply loved by God. And then the fifth chapter of Matthew, the opening of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Oh, wonderfully rich text as well. I often think, you know, how do you, how do you approach preaching on a sermon preached by Jesus? And a good part of me always wants you to say, yeah, what he said, and then sit down. Uh, I'm not going to do that, even though many of you might wish I would. The Sermon on the Mount is, is rich and powerful and insightful just as that famous verse at the end of the Micah passage is. The sermon is also controversial. It's, it's challenging. It can be a bit of a head scratcher at times. And yet in the end, the Sermon on the Mount, just as Micah 6, the Sermon on the Mount in its fullness, the sermon gives us a grounding in the fact that it does not matter what we've done or what we have. It grounds us in the reality that God, that Jesus loves us anyway. He really does. So for the next few moments, let me speak a bit about the Sermon on the Mount, particularly Matthew chapter 5. In the beginning of this passage, we hear that Jesus goes up on a mountain to preach and to teach. 
Now you have to know that at the time that Jesus walked the earth, what really caused a stir with folks about him is that many, many of the Jewish people assumed that the Messiah, the chosen one, the deliverer, that when he came, many folks assumed the Messiah would be sort of a new David, a warrior to overthrow the oppressors and to establish a mighty new earthly kingdom. But what Jesus, what Jesus lived into was not so much about being a new David, so much as a new Moses, a new deliverer of a code of life that God intended for all of us from our creation. And so when Matthew tells us that Jesus went up on the mountain and spoke the word of God, his hearers, I guarantee you, would have made the connection with Moses. They would have gotten that imagery of Moses on Mount Sinai, and they would have known how Jesus had come to set them free. St. Matthew uses three of his 28 chapters to record this sermon, 5, 6, and 7. It's the longest sermon that we have on record, the longest thing we have on record of Jesus saying. Now, Jesus covers a whole lot of ground in these chapters. He teaches us such things as how we are to treat each other, how to interpret the law given by Moses, how to pray, how to fast, and the part I really like, how to tell good religion from bad religion. But Jesus begins the sermon. Jesus begins by preaching about some very specific situations that show God's deep and abiding love for us. Some verses that show us how the rhythms of life, particularly the not so good rhythms of life, which on their face might seem nothing but bad and may actually be bad, yet these things are actually points of deep connection with God. We, of course, know these early verses as the Beatitudes, a listing of situations that people find themselves in that are declared by Jesus to be blessed. And actually, the word that we render in English as blessed is somewhat tough to translate. Some English versions of the Bible will use words like happy or joyful instead of blessed. But the word, the word probably is closest in meaning to the phrase being in favor with God being in favor with God. And if we, if we approach the, this text with this linguistic, linguistic understanding, it's a little easier to make sense of it. Now, making a list of blessings was a common thing for a preacher to do in the first century. It's a common thing for preachers to do today. And it's not just preachers. We all make lists of our blessings, those things we're thankful for, the things we think that God has touched our lives with. I love the practice that, that I hear about people. I can't do it. I don't have this discipline in me. But there are people who keep a blessings or a thanksgiving journal, and they write down at the end of the day or through the day all the things that happened to them that they're thankful for, the things that God has blessed them with. And I, I know folks who do this and they, they tell me that they'll get to the end of a day or end of a week when it's been really stressful and the act of rereading those entries can be tremendously uplifting. It's a life-giving time. But we all know that the list that Jesus gives is not your typical list of what we think of as blessings. His list is a bit of, uh, as they say, a reversal of expectations. I mean, blessed are those who are persecuted, those who are reviled, blessed are those who mourn, those who are poor in spirit. And St. Luke, when he recounts a similar sermon of Jesus, Luke shortens that to blessed are the poor. Now these are definitely not words that can be used to justify the preaching of some in these modern times, that the more stuff you have is a sign of how much God blesses you and loves you. The so-called prosperity gospel, where fancy preachers will stand on plushy carpeted stages in packed arenas and declare that God wants you to have the stuff. The Beatitudes are not those words. Now, the easiest thing to say, and it, it's actually an accurate thing to say, the easiest thing to say is that these blessings point to a time at the end of time when we all, each of us, will go to our reward in heaven or to a time when Jesus comes again to establish heaven on earth in a new way. One might say that these words are words that point to a final overcoming by Jesus of the evils that plague a fallen world. And yes, there is truth to that. But these beatitudes, these blessings, these things that find us in favor with God also point to the now, to the time, as Jesus says, when the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the already but not yet. 
And you know, it's not that God is some grumpy old man in the sky with a kind of personality that yells at kids, hey, get off my yard. God's not like that. No, it's, it's that Jesus wants us to know that the love of God surrounds us fully. And some of the times, some of the times that we can really know this are those moments when we are raw, when we are burned, when we have nowhere else to turn that makes any sense. There's a clarity that comes upon us in these times of our existence, a clarity that is not always easy to get to when we are focused on the stuff. When we are poor in spirit, when we are so worn down by trouble, the trouble that we face in our lives, when our spirit is so empty that we cannot even pray, when we do not have the energy to ask for help, it is then that we rely utterly and completely on God even if we do not know it. It is in those moments that we learn what God wanted the people of Israel to learn from the prophet Micah, that God does not want a transactional relationship with us. God does not expect a quid pro quo, something in exchange for something else. It is in those moments of spiritual poverty when our heart and our spirit and our body and our mind are just plain worn out. It is in those moments that God shouts the divine whisper into our souls that he wants a relationship, not a transaction. And it is then in our poverty that God's love sustains us. And when we are persecuted or reviled, when we stand up for what is right, when we embrace the calling of Micah to do justice and speak out, the world is going to persecute and revile us. When we see the injustices of the world all around us and we do not just offer thoughts and prayers, but we proclaim what is right and we take action. When we are disgusted by video images of the beating to death of an unarmed man by police, and when we call out the statistical reality that such a tragedy is much more likely to happen to a black man than it is to this white man standing preaching you today, when we understand that the proclamation of Micah to love kindness and to walk humbly with God means that we might find ourselves swimming against the tide of culture or political party or social group or even family. When we are calmly or not so calmly proclaiming that God loved the world, the whole world, white, black, gay, straight, everyone, God loved the entire world so much that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all who believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. When we start doing that, we're going to get persecuted. We're going to get reviled. And when we are persecuted, or laughed at, or shouted at, or dismissed as being naive for proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, that the dignity of every human being is of utmost importance to God, when we are persecuted for this and feel utterly alone, it is then that we are reminded that Jesus promises to be with us always, even to the end of the ages. We are reminded that we are never alone in this ministry. It is then that we are reminded that we are loved. And when we mourn, when we grieve a loss, when we lament an action that caused irreparable harm, when we sit and hold the hand of a dying loved one, when we are overcome by our deepest, by our most rooted emotions, when we are in the depths of sorrow, when it's, you know, it's impossible to even fake it till you make it. And no matter how much stuff or experience, or fame, or position in society that we have, when we are deeply mourning, when we would trade it all to just get one more minute, just get one more minute with a spouse, or a child, or a close friend, when all the acquired stuff is ripped away, when we are willing to give it away because none of it really matters, it is then in our mourning that the love of God takes deep, deep, deep root in us, and we know that the kingdom of God is at hand. 
And it is then that we know that God's love for us is now. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and he taught them. And what Jesus taught them, what he teaches us today, is that it really is all about the love that he has for us. A love that is the most important thing in all of creation. It really, really is. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen.